amazing group of people we have to speak with you tonight. Hey, uh, Brandon Bond, in addition to running the emergency management team at Stanford Healthcare, which is Stanford Hospital, the Children's Hospitals, and what is it, 148? 198. 198 locations, they keep adding locations. That's a lot of locations. Uh, as, I, as I mentioned, he is with DMAT. He's also been an emergency medical technician and a certified EMT since 1995. He's been on deployments at a lot of national and international disasters, including some of the famous ones, Hurricane Katrina being uh, one, and I'm sure he's gonna throw a few little war stories, as we call them, uh, in, in the mix. We will transition over here to Brandon Bond, who's going to give us an overview of uh, things that he does and yet another great picture in this slide set. So thanks, Brandon. Yeah, let's uh, welcome everybody again. So listening to some of these conversations, it, it gave me several thoughts on uh, some different ideas and stories and pictures that I wanted to share. Uh, so I'll try to inject some of those things. Uh, but let me first start off with saying, uh, Ken Duker, I'm, the, I'm Brandon Bond. Um, this is how we're going to connect in a true disaster. So now that we, yeah, everybody see what happened there, All right? Face to face. Um, little, little story. So right after the eye of Hurricane Maria passed over San Juan, Puerto Rico, um, our team was launched out to start doing assessments of the hospitals. And uh, I was on a small uh, uh, five person team and the first hospital that we got to was in an area of town that uh, did not have any cellular coverage. The hospital had lost all their communication systems. They had lost power and their backup generators had failed. Uh, for a hospital, that's a very bad uh, situation and condition to be in. Um, so uh, while the team went inside to start the assessment of their needs, um, we had some immediate information of the number of patients, how many patients were on ventilators, how much backup battery they had. And uh, I was tasked with getting a hold of our overhead command team and relay that we have a dire situation, send all the help you can. So I have my incident action plan and my satellite phone, and it's raining a little bit, and I call the first number, and it just kind of rings. I call the second number, and I get a voicemail. I call the third number, and they're like, hello? Hello, can I, can I, can I hear you? And, and I'm just, I'm getting frustrated here, right? And, and then I, I call my buddy Brian over here because I know he's going to answer. And he's like, I can hear him, wait, slow down. Hang on, I got to get something to write with. And, and I, honestly, it was something out of a movie. Absolutely something out of a movie. The bottom line is Murphy comes to every party. Right, so just remember that. And uh, while the mayor said that she would not have you stand up, I am not running for re-election, um, so there may be some interaction parts involved with this. Okay, so I'm Brandon Bond. I'm the administrative director of the Office of Emergency Management for Stanford Healthcare and Stanford Children's Health. I also wear some other hats with U.S. Health and Human Services, the safety officer for the team, and I'm a canine handler with San Mateo County uh, Sheriff Search and Rescue. Um, that being said, while I'm sitting here in uniform this evening. Uh, this presentation uh, does not express the views of the federal government. I have nothing to disclose. Um, and these are uh, just based off of my own anecdotes and experiences throughout the, the years. So in terms of our disaster, and it's important to think about this, right? Our disaster here in our community. There's always that notion of it's not if, but it's when. And even the, the picture on the top left corner of the flooding, that is the basement of Lucille Packer Children's Hospital in 2011. Mm -hmm. And that, that consumed half of the city's emergency response resources uh, that evening. So the bottom line is stuff happens. So we have to be ready to go in our community. And as emergency planners, we cannot prepare you for a disaster. Only you can prepare you for a disaster, right? So with that being said, imagine if you're sitting here this evening or at your work and we just experienced that 7.2 earthquake. Roads are down, communications are limited, and we'll say for this scenario, you're all at work, okay? And some perspective based off of the USGS presentation, when we responded to the earthquake in Haiti, we experienced two aftershocks that were six point plus. So just some perspective on that. All right, so here we go, it's game time. Okay, go ahead and stand up. It's, it's, you've been sitting for a while, this is a good little, uh, good little stretch break. Good little stretch break, okay? Interactive part of the game. All right, 
So you guys are already sitting, so that's yielding. You're going to forgive the prize. Okay, remain standing if, remain standing if you have an emergency kit at home. All right, good, to be expected of this room. Remain standing if you have a communications plan with your family. Uh-oh, okay, we have some homework to do. If you have enough water for your whole family for seven days at home. Okay, a little more homework to do. If you have an out-of-state contact that your whole family will call in an emergency where cell service is out locally. Excellent. You have an emergency kit at work. Okay. If you have a plan for yourself and your family so that you could stay at work for three days. Pretty good. Okay, so for final jeopardy, final jeopardy, remain standing if that emergency contact number is memorized. <laughs> All right. So, very good, excellent. There's some wonderful handouts and refreshments for you afterwards for participating. Uh, so we, even as a room full of emergency preparedness junkies, we all have a little bit of work to do, right? There's always something that we can do to be better prepared while the hospital is calling me about an emergency. Okay, I don't have to respond to that one. So a little bit about the 2017 hurricane season. Uh, this picture is phenomenal. What was the last time we saw three hurricanes simultaneous in the Atlantic? I'm pretty sure it was called a movie the day after tomorrow. <laughs> and, and as with uh, the new technology, you can see just below uh, where it says 65.8 degrees, the little purple dot, that's my location sitting with all of these folks here and 35 other of our team members with a storm bearing down of 165 degrees, uh, 165 mile an hour and 200 mile an hour plus. Absolutely phenomenal. You could feel the pressure of your ears getting ready to pop. So timelines of events, and this is a, a, a bit hard to see on the screen, but um, again, DMAT CA6 is a uh, federal emergency response team under United States Health and Human Services. We all have day jobs, but then when a major disaster hits, we get called up to serve as a medical response team, um, very similar to uh, military reserve, except that we are um, civilian uniform services. So um, our team works on a rotational period in terms of on-call months, and August, we were not on-call. So you know, we were relaxed in steady state. Uh, but Hurricane Harvey came into Texas. Um, many of the teams in the system got deployed, and a lot of the teams needed additional uh, staff. So we sent about 13 of our team members to go help support other teams in the nation to Texas with Hurricane Harvey. Um, Missions ranged from supporting evacuations to medical shelter missions. And as Hurricane Harvey grew, more and more teams across the nation were getting de deployed. And at one point, um, over half of the deployable DMAT teams, and there's 52 in the nation, um, were operational in Texas. And we had been put on alert. And for three days, I had to drop my kids off at school, kiss them goodbye, and say, I may be going to Texas today because we literally were that close to getting launched to Texas. That weekend on September 4th, there was this little storm starting to churn called Irma. And the pre-deployment model for hurricanes, if there is a category three hurricane or above that's threatening the continental United States or its territories to automatically start pre-deploying assets into that theater of operations. Well, in this case, everything was committed to Texas and the Gulf states. So one, uh, a FEMA incident management team and a health and human services incident response coordination team, all those acronyms, and one DMAT got sent to stage in Puerto Rico ahead of Hurricane Irma. And so our first task was to prepare to ride out this category four or five storm. And that was our first mission set. One, one, one DMAT, three hurricanes, we called ourselves the Atlantic Task Force. <laughs> so immediately after the eye passing with Hurricane Irma, uh, we were launched to the U.S. Virgin Islands to St. Thomas to Schneider Regional Medical Center. Uh, this is a hospital that is uh, equivalent to hospitals in, here on the mainland. Um, it is accredited by Joint Commission, just as we are, uh, but they had lost their watertight roof membrane. 
and you're in the tropics and it's a hurricane, it rains. Um, so they immediately started evacuating the hospital and uh, we came in, supported the evacuation, supported augmentation of their emergency department. And then we partnered with the uh, US military to build a alternate uh, field hospital. And we worked to identify all of the hemodialysis patients in the Virgin Island territories and evacuate them to Puerto Rico. Uh, and then finally our mission was starting to come to a close. And some of our team members started to deploy home. And then here comes another hurricane called Maria, a bigger hurricane. So the decision was made that all U.S. federal personnel were going to be evacuated out of the Virgin Islands back to Puerto Rico. That was the longest eight-hour day that I've ever had sitting in an airport with no air conditioning and full uniform. We thought we were getting on a C-130, but the plane broke down and we were literally hitchhiking, waiting for a ride. So anecdotally, we finally got onto a 737 that was chartered by FEMA to fly us back to Puerto Rico. Now, all of the uh, civilian uniform responders have federal law enforcement force protection. We don't move without a federal law enforcement officer in full tactical gear with us. That is really a, a lesson out of Hurricane Katrina. And so here we have this airplane that's full of federal response personnel and our team's medical team, we have a lot of narcotics and we have all of these um, SWAT officers from various federal law enforcement agencies, one of them being the U.S. Forest Service, who they spend most of their time in marijuana grows, not in California. And we had a few civilian responders from agencies like the American Red Cross. And interestingly enough, there's this uh, agreement given the drug trafficking between the Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico, even though they're U.S. territories, when you, when you land in uh, Puerto Rico, you still have to clear bus Customs and Border Patrol. Well, that frustrated some of us because it's been a very long day and now we have to go through Customs and Border Patrol. And I kid you not, the flight attendant got up and said, I would ask that every passenger that has a gun, please stand up and exit the plane first. Now, I don't think you're ever going to hear that again. <laughs> and, and when are you on a plane that's full of guns and narcotics legally? I've never experienced that, probably never will again. So as we, as we prepare for Hurricane Maria, suddenly we realize, well, we have these some 115 dialysis patients that are in a dialysis shelter that we've been supporting operations with that is not going to withstand the Category 5 hurricane. And so we had to scramble to load up those patients, get them to the airport on that same 737 and off of the ground ahead of the airport closing. We literally had a 90-minute window to hand carry these passengers up the stairway and get them airborne. And then we sheltered in place. Uh, we sat in a big parking structure on hotel lounge chairs for 15 hours. Um, once the storm finally passed, uh, we came out, regrouped, reuniformed, and immediately started doing uh, hospital assessments, started setting up more base of operations, um, back to the Virgin Islands to uh, finish supporting that mission, and then uh, finally we came home. So in, in total, um, of our 85 team members, um, nearly 80% of the team deployed during this hurricane season. Um, total length of deployment for our team was six weeks. Um, so, I, you know, on behalf of the team and the command staff, really um, thank the Citizen Corps Council for that recognition uh, for what the team does. So, what do we, how does that all happen? Thank you. So, I'll give credit to Brian Sharon for helping put this slide together. I'll give you a little example of what that all looks like in terms of travel and time. So Hurricane Harvey, Category 3 hurricane, kind of came in and did a loop-de-loop, -loop, uh, threw everybody for a curve there. Our first launch was teammates into uh, Louisiana and then down further in the Gulf states into Texas. Um, then we had some deployment uh, demobilization back home to the Bay Area uh, and then Hurricane Irma started to sneak up. So then we launched personnel to Puerto Rico, 
then to Virgin Islands, and then we had to launch additional personnel to Florida. Because remember, after Hurricane Irma passed over uh, Puerto Rico, then it was going straight up into Florida. So you have a, a multi-tier theater of disaster response. Then Hurricane Jose came in and caused a scare for everybody, but it kind of went and danced around a little bit and, and gave us some rain, but not much happened from there. Oh yeah, there was Katya who visited Mexico. Then we dropped folks further into Florida and down to the Keys. And we did our loop-de-loop -loop to Puerto Rico. And then Maria came and visited us and back to the Virgin Islands. Started sending some folks up to Alabama and then demobilization started to occur. And then we finally got everybody home. It was just an amazing whirlwind of activity. Now that's one team. Imagine trying to track the some 50 plus teams and the 1800 team members just from one agency that was involved in this. Now to take this back to, to kind of home base here, every disaster medical team, every urban search and rescue team was at one point during this hurricane season deployed. What would have happened if that earthquake had hit at that same period, right? So it really brings back the point that all disasters are local. So what should we expect? It's not gonna be easy. It never is, right? And a lot of times you're going to be doing makeshift activities. You know, anything from what we experienced with the mismanagement of evacuees in Hurricane Katrina, to austere medical conditions, to utilizing the luggage carts as mass transport as pe people are being evacuated, to in this case, you can see a traction device made out of uh, legs of a, uh, a stretcher and then using debris to actually get the, the weight of the traction. So don't think you're gonna be staying at five-star hotels. Well, I, it, 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 don't spoil the. Don't spoil it. And and I'll tell you uh, in terms of lessons learned, um, luggage belts in airports can be very very comfortable. Also the 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 luggage conveyors that take the luggage up to the plane also very comfortable. And don't think that if you're going to a big disaster in the south in the summer that you're not going to need a warm sleeping bag, because in this kindergarten FEMA was able to drop a generator and crank their air conditioning back on. And that was one of the coldest nights I've ever experienced. It's not gonna be a luxury resort, whether you're sleeping on the floor in a closet or the front lawn of the US Embassy. But amazingly enough, and I, I didn't put the picture in there because I didn't want to give you the wrong idea. After the nine days on Virgin Islands and the eight hours, 12 hours in the stinky airport, just dripping in sweat, we finally get back to Puerto Rico and the only hotel that had rooms left was the Condado Vanderbilt, a five-star luxury resort hotel. I slept so good that night. <laughs> and if you have to ride out a Category 5 hurricane, you want to ride it out in a five-star hotel. <laughs> they really did it right. So remember, all disasters are local. So here, you know, in the U.S. Virgin Islands, they're putting out on the daily news, um, scarce hours, scarce goods on St. Croix. There was curfews in place uh, throughout the disasters. Um, amazingly enough, I think it was during one of the playoff regions, they opened up the curfew hours a little bit so people could go watch the game, but that's another story. Um, and then, you know, here in the Bay Area, Scarcity of a different factor. <laughs> now, I, no joke around this picture. So I, I, I took this picture during the Napa Valley fires and, and I just thought, I, and what I took it as is people were really trying to just support the wineries. Um, but, you know, it, it was just the reality of the Bay Area. Um, I will say with that incident, the hospital, uh, we were impacted by the Napa Valley fires as everybody was. Um, indirectly as the smoke started to inundate the Bay Area. Um, smoke and uh, sterile environments, they don't go hand in hand. Um, so we, uh, we cornered the market basically on portable HEPA filters and then once we were able to determine how many HEPA filters we needed to maintain operations, 
we broke off the additional 30 resources that we had and then we donated an additional 10,000 N95 masks and drove up on Sunday and uh, delivered goods to every single uh, hospital in Napa and Sonoma County. So, you know, it really takes a community to come together and make things happen. But again, it's not business as usual. So the power, the picture on the left is a power pole in St. Thomas. And when you have uh, above ground power infrastructure and you experience a disaster, these lines break. And in this case, you, know, you think about they literally are an island and you have to get that infrastructure barged in from somewhere and the crews and the trucks. And even the same, the picture on the right, it, I took that um, in San Bruno after the explosion. And uh, I, the reason why I took it, I was just absolutely amazed at the fact that they are, they are doing essentially handwork, right? No heavy equipment, no, no special trucks. I mean, they're raising that power pool by hand because it is certainly not business as usual. Um, cash on hand. So we're, as a part of our response, our, our general deployments are two to three weeks. And we're, uh, part of our packing list is several hundred dollars in cash. And then we get you know, per, per diem reimbursement. Well, there's a couple reasons that the ATMs go down. Number one, power. Number two, communications lines. And number three, they run out of money. And the banks can't restock them. So I guess that's three reasons. And as we had a couple points where we were staying in hotels. Um, we had to pay for the incidentals. And, you know, we would, or, first time I'm not eating an MRE, you bet I'm going to get a good big hamburger. Well, we couldn't pay for the incidentals because we didn't have enough cash because the communications systems was down. The hotel couldn't run their ATM. And didn't think between hurricanes to go back to the bank and restock on cash, right? Because you have your pre-deployment disaster readiness checklist and you're ready to go, but you have this little window of kind of, I get to sleep, I get to eat, and didn't re-account that, oh my gosh, we're low on cash and we're gonna be here for another two to three weeks. So where do you find money in a disaster? There was a local federal uh, protective services officer at the hotel. I said, any, any thoughts on where we could get cash? And he said, yeah, go down to the Sheraton, go to the casino, <laughs> don't talk to the young guy at the do not enter line, ask for the manager, make sure you're in uniform, and they'll walk you back to the ATMs. They've got plenty of cash. <laughs> so we sent a little group down and we restocked cash for the entire team. But certainly that was a, a lesson learned on that one. So preparedness starts with you, the individual, and the families. It's, and, it, and then from there we branch out to the neighborhood. And then after that we get to the business in the city. And the key part to that is the city is going to be recovering the critical infrastructure and you know, roads, power, and things like that. But it's you, the people that employ and work the local commerce that is really is what is going to allow recovery to take place. We were so fortunate. We were staying uh, in a empty business. Uh, just any, just imagine any company where they've shelled everything out and we've got, there was anywhere from six to 70 responders on cots lined up in this business. And the reason why that area was chosen is because the FBI could secure it. It had, it had perimeter fences and could be secured for all the federal responders to stay there. And it had a backup generator and one working shower. I mean, that is more than you can ask for. And, and a couple weeks into it, there was a local business and the individual uh, was able to get a curfew pass and he owned a very small restaurant and started, uh, you know, going to the finding sourcing through the local market and then had a very limited menu, but let us know that he was open. And so before we would go on our shift, we would write a note with what our order was, tape it to his door of the restaurant, and then we'd come back and he'd have, you know, little to-go boxes of hot, fresh food for us. And that was such an amazing thing. And, and and late into the deployment, I said, you know, thank you so much for doing this. Thank you for being here. You know, just, it is really great instead of eating MREs to, 
to have a fresh meal. He says, no, no, you don't understand. If you weren't here, then I'd be at home staring at a dark wall getting drunk. <laughs> and, and it really just, I mean, put it into perspective that, you know, what the, what the people going through in these disaster zones are dealing with. So it's so important as a community to be prepared to take care of each other um, to keep things up and running. All right, here we go. Second round of interactivity. Are you ready? Okay. I have here a simple bottle of water. I want you to take a moment and I want you to discuss with your neighbors what you could do with this simple bottle of water in a disaster. Okay, go. Gotta make a sharp edge. I've got a nice uh, bladed, bladed weapon. <laughs> <laughs> I've actually made an occlusive dressing with one. Ah, there we go. Really? That, that, you'll need that because I just made it into a knife and bladed weapon. Okay, there we go. So, <laughs> when I'm done stabbing, <laughs> you punch holes in them. Yep. Like, I All right. <laughs> I failed to mention you have a pair of trauma shears and some medical tape. <laughs> you need to watch the MacGyver TV series. <laughs> All right. So improvise, overcome, and adapt. That is really what it takes to get through any type of disaster environment. All right. Any medical personnel in the room? Andy, what do you see? Well, well it's interesting because we used to use uh, larger Problems for that, but that's a urine collection system. So a urine collection system, absolutely, with a condom catheter, no less. Okay, improvise, overcome, and adapt. So on the left, did you come up with wound irrigation? All right. On the right, that is the restroom at the Haiti International Airport. Urine collection system. All right. On the left. We're creating, be careful with the knife you see on the bottom of the screen, and here, using the water bottle as a spacer. This was uh, Typhoon Haiyan uh, in the Philippines. Okay, so there you see another spacer. Um, what do we see on the right of the spacer? A little uh, eye cup, okay? Or if you had a, a protruding object, and build the cup around it and then bandage. Um, this is probably the last time you'll ever see a trauma surgeon in flip-flops on his knees scrubbing a tent, but using the water to uh, clean the surgical unit. Uh, here in Haiti, we uh, had a baby delivered and uh, they stacked the water bottles um, to create the OB bed. Huh. I I believe she named the baby Sam under after Uncle Sam. I'm not making that up. Um, on the right, you see they're using a needle to poke holes to create irrigation bottles as a safety officer. I would much rather see that needle in the sharps container, but nonetheless, um, creating a, a nice irrigation piece. Uh, this was again in the Philippines. Uh, I found myself working in a UN pharmaceutical tent. Um, a whole nother story about being hot. And uh, so I took the water bottle and I uh, used it to do my counting of the pills and then poured them into the little plastic bags and then we typed up um, uh, translated uh, labels. And of course, we all need coffee. This is the newest one. This happened in the Virgin Islands. Anything that we missed? A few good ones out there, sir. Try it lengthwise and use it as a split. Outstanding. Yes, sir. You can filter water, you can turn it upside down, cut off the top, uh, put charcoal from the grill. Yep, and then make your coffee. Because <laughs> now, did anybody come up with hydration? <laughs> Excellent. So the number one cause of responder injuries is because of dehydration. Hydrate, hydrate, hydrate. All right, so. We have some more work to do based off of our earlier exercise. Um, there's plenty of tools and templates that are out there to help you be prepared. And then final thoughts, I will end on this picture. So this is my family. Um, and on the right is a card that my kids made that stayed on the top of my deployment bag. 
as a professional responder, um, it's difficult to leave the family, but they support and understand what it is that we're doing. We're going out to help people. But we're there for a limited time, and then we turn around and we come home. And you come home back to beautiful, sunny Palo Alto. And yet the local communities are still devastated. Um, following some of our friends and colleagues that we made in the Virgin Islands, um, one of them, uh, she and her husband this week, and the storm happened September 4th, just got into a new apartment that does not have any mold and has a secure roof over their head. So it's an important piece to think, again, all disasters are local. It's fun to tell stories about being a, a responder and going off and doing wonderful things, but the, the true heroes are the individuals who live in that community, who band together to pull through and help each other out and then continue and carry on the commerce and their lives. And that is you when it's our turn for the disaster. So with that, thank you very much.